The Lost Symbol written by Dan Brown Chapter 1 The Otis elevator climbing the south pillar of the Eiffel Tower was overflowing with tourists Inside the cram lift an austere businessman in a press suit gazed down at the boy beside him You look pale son you should have stayed on the ground I'm okay the boy answered struggling to control his anxiety I'll get out on the next level I can read the man leaned closer I thought by now you would have gotten over this he brushed the child's cheek affectionately the boy felt ashamed to disappoint his father but he could barely hear through the ringing in his ears I can breathe I've got to get out of this box The elevator operator was saying something reassuring about the lift's articulate pistons and puddle iron construction. Far beneath them, the streets of Paris stretched out in all directions. Almost there, the boy told himself, craning his neck and looking up at the unloading platform. Just hold on. As the lift angled steeply toward the upper viewing deck, the shaft began to narrow. its massive studs contracting into a tight vertical tunnel that i don't think <laughs> suddenly a staccato crack echoed overhead the carriage jerked swaying awkwardly to one side freight cables began whipping around the carriage thrashing like snakes the boy reached out for his father dad the eyes locked for one terrifying second then the bottom dropped out robert langton jolted upright in his soft leather seat startling out of the semi-conscious daydream he was sitting all alone in the enormous cabin of a falcon 2000 ex corporate jet as it bounced its way through turbulence in the background the dual pratt and Whitney engines hummed evenly. Mr. Langdon, the intercom crackled overhead. We're on final approach. Langdon sat up straight and slid his lecture notes back into his leather day bag. He had been halfway through reviewing Masonic symbology when his mind had drifted. The daydream about his late father, Langdon suspected, had been stirred by this morning's unexpected invitation from Langdon's long-time mentor Peter Solomon the other man i never want to disappoint 50 year old philanthropist historian and scientist had taken Langdon under his wing nearly 30 years ago in many ways filling the void left by Langdon's father's death despite the man's influential family dynasty and massive wealth Langdon had found humility and warmth in Solomon's soft gray eyes outside the window the sun had set but Langdon could still make out the slender silhouette of world's largest obelisk rising on the horizon like the spire of an ancient gnomon the 555 foot marble faced obelisk marked this nation's heart all around the spire the meticulous geometry of streets and monuments radiated outward even from the air washington dc exuded an almost mystical power langdon loved this city and as the jet touched down he felt a rising excitement about what lay ahead the jet taxied to a private terminal somewhere in the vast expanse of dulles international airport and came to a stop. Langdon gathered his things, thanked the pilot, and stepped out of the jet's luxurious interior onto the fold-out staircase. The cold January air felt liberating. Breathe, Robert, he thought, appreciating the wide open spaces. A blanket of white fog crept across the runway, and Langdon had sensation he was stepping into a marsh as he descended onto the misty tarmac. 
Hello, hello. A sing song British voice shouted from the across the tarmac. Professor Langdon. Langdon looked up to see a middle aged woman with a badge and clipboard hurrying toward him, waving happily as he approached. Curly blonde hair protruded from under a stylish neat old hat. Welcome to Washington, sir. Langdon smiled. Thank you. My name is Pam from Passenger Service. The woman spoke with an exuberance that was almost unsettling. If you'll come with me, sir, your car is waiting. Langdon followed her across the runway toward the signature terminal, which was surrounded by a glistening private jets. The taxi stand for the rich and the famous. I hate to embrace you, Professor, the woman said, sounding sheepish. But you are the Robert Langdon who writes books about symbols and the religion, aren't you? Langdon hesitated and then nodded. I thought so, she said, beaming. My book group read your book about the sacred feminine and the church. What a delicious scandal that one cost. You do enjoy putting the fox in the hen house. Langdon smiled. Scandal wasn't really my intention. The woman seemed to sense Langdon was not in the mood to discuss his work. I'm sorry. Listen to me rattling on. I know you'll probably get tired of being recognized, but it's your own fault. She played for emotion to his clothing. Your uniform gave you away. My uniform? Langdon glanced down at his attire. He was wearing his usual charcoal turtleneck, Harry's tweed jacket, khakis, and a collegiate Cordovan loafers, his standard attire for the classroom lecture circuit, author photos, and social events. The woman laughed. The startle necks you wear are so dated. You'd look much sharper in a tie. No chance, Langdon thought. Little noses. Necties had been required six days a week when Langdon attended Philip's Exeter Academy, and despite the headmaster's romantic claims that the origin of the cravat went back to the silk, as Scalia owned by Roman orators to warm their vocal cords, Langdon knew that, etymologically, Herbert actually derived from a ruthless band of crowd mercenaries who don't knot it, naked ships before they stormed into battle. To this day, this ancient battle garb was donned by modern office of warriors hoping to intimidate their enemies in daily boardroom battles. Thanks for the advice, Langdon said with a chuckle. I will consider a tie in the future. Mercifully, a professional-looking man in a dark suit got out of a sleek Lincoln Tower car parked near the terminal and held up his finger. Mr. Langdon, I'm Charles with Beldway Limousin. He opened the passenger door. Good evening, sir. Welcome to Washington. Langdon tipped palm for her hospitality and then climbed into the plush interior of the town car. The driver showed him the temperature controls, the bottle water, and the basket of hot muffins. Seconds later, Langdon was speeding away on a private access road. So this is how the other half leaves. As the driver gunned the car up, wind-soaked drive, he consulted his passenger manifest and placed a quick call. This is... Beltway limousine, the driver said with professional efficiency. I was asked to confirm once my passenger had landed, he paused. Yes, sir, your guest Mr. Langdon has arrived, and I will deliver him to the Capitol building by 7 p.m. You're welcome, sir, he hung up. Langdon had to smile, no stone left unturned. Peter Solomon's attention to detail was one of his most potent assets allowing him to manage his substantial power with apparent ease and a few billion dollars in the bank doesn't hurt either. Langdon settled into the plushed leather seat and closed his eyes as the noise of the airport faded behind him. The US capital was a half hour away and he appreciated the time alone to gather his thoughts. Everything had happened so quickly today that Langdon only now began to think in earnest about the incredible evening that lay ahead.
arriving under a veil of secrecy, Langdon thought, amused by the prospect. Ten miles from the Capitol building, a lone figure was eagerly preparing for Robert Langdon's arrival. Like and subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for the upcoming uploads.